let me make sure that I can see chat and I can. Perfect. So um, my name is Ian Littman and we're going to talk about OAuth today. Uh, if you want to follow along with these slides, uh, you can go to en.im slash OAuth SW20. There are a number of places in these slides that are linked and I will have these slides available uh, afterwards. Uh, they will be in uh, LinkedIn joined in later as well. So there are additional resources, code samples, etc. So you'll probably want to look at the slides. So you've probably seen this uh, login with Google button. In fact, the way that I log into this presentation software slides.com is actually via Google using OAuth. So we'll figure out in the duration of this presentation how this OAuth flow actually works as well as how to implement either OAuth client or an OAuth provider within your own application. So one key piece of OAuth is the concept of grant types. We'll explain what exactly those are and what uh, what you can use and when you should use the, uh, the various grants, as well as kind of implementation level details of what makes each grant tick. Additionally, we will look at how to implement things from a code perspective, both on the client side and using the Lego Auth 2 server package on the server side. For cases where the primary intent of the OAuth grant is uh, some sort of client-side interaction. I have um, about the most basic JavaScript sample code that we can use in the cases where it's server-side, the examples uh, on the client, or, um, yeah, in the case of server-side, the examples client-side are written in PHP and all of those are in a GitHub repo uh, and have been since I did this presentation back in late January in, um, uh, at PHP Benelux. So for the sake of time, there are a number of things that we won't cover. First off, this is an OAuth 2 only presentation. We're not dealing with OAuth 1.x because, well, it's been deprecated and it's a bit more difficult to get a handle on. Additionally, the implementation details that we'll be looking at are uh, specific to kind of a PSR7 uh, request response side of things. That means that you would have to do a few more tweaks to get this to work with Symfony, potentially use a different package. And likewise, we won't go into uh, using this with Laravel either. While Laravel does use the League OAuth 2 server package under the hood, there is uh, abundant documentation on Laravel Passport, which wraps that functionality to use in a Laravel context. So the code samples that we'll be using here are at github.com slash ensltx slash oauth sample. And right now I've pinned that repository uh, as kind of a featured repo on my profile. So uh, my GitHub username is the same as my Twitter handle. If you go to my GitHub, you'll see that uh, repo front and center. All the code that um, we see here is available there. And uh, I just um, set this up on a uh, VM on, um, on the cloud uh, because it turns out Docker doesn't want to play nicely with me on my local machine setting up the database instance that is actually backing the service. So I know for a fact that this is actually pretty simple to uh, set up on your own because I just did a little bit earlier. It's just a matter of pull down the repo, Docker compose up, build, and follow the readme. Now, one thing to note here is OAuth 2.0, because it doesn't have a whole bunch of signatures and such within the um, uh, headers or message parameters or anything like that, it requires use over HTTPS. It assumes that you have a secure connection in order to maintain the security of the entire protocol. Therefore, the example that I will show you is not technically OAuth 2 spec compliant because I'm running over it over insecure HTTP. It doesn't really matter for the uh, demo purposes, but at least get a cert with Let's Encrypt if you want to host your own OAuth flow. Now, 
One key component of the examples that I'll be using is this Lego Auth2 server. It makes sure to build a spec compliant OAuth2 implementation for the grant types that it supports, which are all the ones that we have in the example, while providing interfaces for actually storing data. Uh, and those interfaces aren't, um, they aren't terribly opinionated, but they're trying to allow the allow your application to do a minimal amount of work to uh, handle the persistence of um, tokens and other pieces of the OAuth process. Lego OAuth 2 server ends up um, kind of encoding or potentially pushing client side a fair amount of its um, logic and storage so that its footprint uh, within a database or data store is a little bit smaller. You still have to implement the interfaces to actually connect the OAuth 2 server into whatever your preferred data store is, whether that's a database or Redis or what have you. But that's actually a feature, not a bug, because then you can uh, fit in various implementations, ORMs, direct SQL, some um, rather exotic data store, or even potentially uh, flat configuration arrays, like we'll see in uh, this particular application. So chances are decent. There, there are a couple other PHP libraries that do OAuth 2 as well with varying degrees of opinionation, but there's a reason why Laravel decided to build its OAuth implementation around the OAuth 2 server. Now, let's talk about grant types. There, this is not an exhaustive list. There are a couple others, in fact, on an implementation that uh, I just caught yesterday for a client. They're actually using an OAuth 2 grant type that I hadn't seen before with some uh, public key uh, back and forth there. However, these are the common ones where you, depending on use case, you'll use one of these particular grant types, which translates to a flow of various requests and responses in order to authenticate a user or a system um, via OAuth. In all likelihood, we will run out of time before we get to the device auth uh, authorization grant. However, we will cover resource owner password credentials, refresh token client credentials, implicit and authorization code grants. And again, we'll explain what criteria you have to decide uh, which grant is actually the best for your application if you're faced with a choice of multiple. Now, if you're integrating with an external provider, then in all likelihood, they're going to have a very limited number of grant types to pick from, again, depending on use case. So the decision's kind of made for you. Now, let's start off with a password grant. This is the most lightweight grant in terms of differences from how you would potentially normally do some sort of API-based login on your application. You have a minimal number of changes required to take your existing flow and make it OAuth2 compliant. The one thing to note here is this is always operating on behalf of a specific user rather than operating system to system. Now, this, the assumption here is that you are working within the framework of some sort of trusted application where usually that's uh, some sort of first party application. For example, the Twitter mobile app logging in to the Twitter website. You're not having any redirects. You are just calling against the OAuth endpoint and getting a response back. And the key thing with a trusted client here is that the client is actually going to see that end user's primary credentials. If the third party service or, or the service in general doesn't trust that client to not uh, scrape and save that user's password for, for nefarious reasons, then um, this is not actually the correct flow. Additionally, this uh, flow disallows you from building, say, uh, two-factor auth or other sorts of um, security enhancements 
into the authentication flow. I can't, with my username and password, log in and then before being fully authenticated, say, actually, I need to send a text message to your phone or you need to enter a code from your authenticator app. That is, that is outside this flow and not really possible with the standard password grant. You would actually want to use some other grant for that or you would end up tacking on proprietary functionality. So uh, one other thing to note here is that the, this is a password grant for a user logging in on um, the same device that they actually need to make future API calls from. The device authorization grant uh, at the end of this presentation time permitting is for the case that you can't actually log in on the same device that you're attempting authorization for, for example, a smart TV or something that doesn't necessarily have a proper keyboard. So a final thing here is that you'll see uh, this concept of a confidential client uh, throughout this presentation where that just means the ability to keep a secret value, say a API key or, or client password actually secret. And really the only way of doing that sort of secret secrecy is by not storing the secret on the client at all. It might be stored in a server somewhere and this uh, OAuth password flow can work if you are hosting some sort of web app with a plain old login form and then going back to uh, that authentication API or authorization API in order to um, see whether the credentials match. In that case, yeah, you can take a secret um, token, put it somewhere in the application configuration, and the end user can't get at it. However, if you're dealing with a mobile app of some sort or something on the website that's fully client side, you don't have that flexibility. Anything that gets shipped down to the client side, you have to assume that somebody is going to decompile that mobile app or look at the source for that web page and is going to extract that secret. As such, it's not even worth including the secret at all in explicitly saying, this is not a confidential client. We're going to operate without any additional parameter other than an application specific uh, identifier that we'll see in a moment. So those are kind of the ground rules for deciding whether to use a password grant. Let's actually look at the flow. Now, you'll see a bunch of these ASCII art drawings throughout this presentation. These are from the RFC and each source is linked at the bottom of, of these slides. So the concept of this resource owner is the user who has a profile or has access to documents or what have you. They are typing those, uh, the, their primary credentials, so username and password, into their client, so maybe a mobile app, or maybe a web form where uh, all of your functionality is actually server side. That username and password is sent back to the authorization server, who has the identity of the user and um, can actually verify the password on its side. And if that authentication and verification succeeds, then you get an access token back and potentially a refresh token, which we'll go into later. That's the entire flow. So what does that look like implementation wise? Well, the password grant uh, you would call to a, a URL that looks something like this as a post request uh, and all of your uh, HTTP calls within OAuth 2 are specced as either uh, query string parameters or fragment parameters or URL encoded um, body. So you can use a plain old web form to, uh, to send these requests if you really want to. The if you see a JSON uh, implementation on the request body for this, then that's actually not spec compliant. In any case, you take uh, the 
uh, grant type client ID, username, and password, send that over to the server. Well, let's actually go through what each of these fields are. So first off, you have this grant type field. Anytime you're asking for a token from an OAuth uh, token endpoint, you're going to provide this grant type because that's going to determine what sort of fields are provided in the rest of the request. In this case, that grant type is password. You'll also provide a client ID. In this case, we're assuming that this is some mobile app, so we can't keep secret secret. All we're providing to identify that client is this ID saying, hey, I'm whatever the mobile app is. Then we're providing the user's primary credentials. These field names are always going to be username and password. Now, if we were dealing with some sort of server-to-server -server proxy implementation here, where we could keep a secret value actually secret, that's where the client secret would come in to allow for a little bit more security and a little bit more access potentially than a client-only implementation would be. And again, if you are integrating with an external provider, then they'll have opinions on whether you include this or not. Another parameter that is completely optional, but uh, depending on the API you can provide is this idea of a scope. Now an OAuth2 scope, don't think, it, don't think of it as permissions for that particular user. Think of it as permissions that are conferred to this particular authentication session where this application is operating on a user's behalf. If you've logged in, to something via GitHub or Google and seen their OAuth consent dialogue saying, this application wants to perform these particular activities on behalf of you, are you okay with that? That's where scopes come in. It's a subset of the user's normal permissions tailored to some portion of app functionality that a third party or a first party app is asking, hey, can I do these particular activities on a user's behalf? Again, scope is optional, but it's built into the OAuth2 spec because it's quite useful. Now, you probably don't want to get super fine-grained with scopes. If you have a resource level scope for every single document in your document store or uh, every single repository, in your version control service, then anytime you want to confer additional scopes for that user, you need to ask the authorization server again, hey, can I get this scope as well? And you have to run through the entire auth process again. So you want to pick the amount of granularity that you have with scopes carefully so that the user doesn't have to reauthenticate constantly. To give you an idea of uh, how scopes could potentially look in a larger system, well, Here's a small subset of the scopes that Google allows with their OAuth2 implementation. There's no hard and fast rule around how scope names need to be formatted. In Google's case, they actually use uh, this URL style formatting. I'm not certain whether these URLs are actually, um, whether you can visit them, but it, my bet is that the answer is yes, but you can, potentially tell people something about what these scopes confer by carefully choosing scope names. Yes, you don't get a free pass on naming things on the, uh, on the OAuth side, although I don't think we have to deal with cache invalidation here and hopefully not off by one errors either. So we've made this request to the password uh, grant endpoint. And the response we get, assuming that the authorization succeeds, is this. Yes, this is a JSON response. So you're, you're sending a form encoded or URL encoded uh, request and getting a JSON response back. You get the token type, which there are a few others, however, um, your general OAuth2 implementations use the bearer token, as does the League OAuth2 server. You're told how many seconds you have before this access token expires. 
you get the access token itself. And that is actually a JWT. In the case of uh, at least League OAuth, now there's no spec saying that OAuth 2 access tokens have to be JWTs. Uh, they can be opaque tokens, and, and that's absolutely fine. However, in the case of League OAuth, uh, they're for a, a couple of reasons in terms of actually pushing uh, storage requirements to the client, they're JWTs. So a JWT or JSON web token take, has three parts, a header, a payload, and a signature. The header says, hey, this is a JWT, and here is the signature algorithm that we're using to verify that, yes, this came from a legitimate server. You can actually validate these client side, provided that you have uh, the proper key to, uh, to run that signature process. So that signature is actually over both the header and the payload. So let's look at what uh, the payload is in this case. So we've got uh, an audience uh, value here. And yes, the, these uh, keys in the object, what they call JWT claims, are rather short because you'll be sending this JWT across the wire on every single API request you do with this API. Anyway, you've got an audience value, which is just the client ID of whatever OAuth provider uh, you're using. You have the uh, subject ID here, which is the ID of the user on behalf of whom you're working. You have this uh, random string here. It's just a token ID uh, called JTI. And you have a few dates. The uh, issued at, not valid before. So if you want to issue a JWT that starts being valid at a later date, and the expiration time. In this case, uh, as you saw earlier, these JWTs expire in an hour, and that's completely configurable within uh, League OAuth. So this is 3,600 seconds uh, later than the issue time. You can add additional claims to JWTs, keeping in mind that, again, this is set for the entire length of that access token and um, it's going to increase the payload size of your response. In the case of Lee Go Off, it adds this scopes parameter so that it knows the level of access that was granted for this token. Now, what exactly happens when a refresh token, or sorry, when an access token expires? You don't wanna necessarily go back and ask the user for their uh, email address and password again. That's where a refresh token comes in, which is that other value that I kind of glossed over earlier. So what you do with that refresh token is when your access token expires, you turn around and, or even before your access token expires, you turn around and request to that API, to that authorization API, say, hey, I need to uh, authenticate on behalf of this user again. Here's my refresh token. Here's my client ID. Potentially, here's my client secret. And here's the refresh token itself. And that API will give you another access token and probably another refresh token. This is the process that I just mentioned where you're going, uh, you start off with an access token refresh token. You, use that against uh, whatever API you're using it against. And then uh, when things expire, you go back to the authorization server, get another token, and uh, continue along your day. And the authorization server can decide whether or not to give you another refresh token when you, uh, when you ask for an access token with a refresh token. So, the request payload on that looks like this. Instead of 
having a grant type of password and the username and password provided. Instead, we have this grant type of refresh token, and we're providing that same refresh token that we got in the access token earlier. Now, that is both your uh, password and uh, refresh token grants. What if you actually want to act on behalf of a system server to server and not necessarily on behalf of a given user? Well, there's an OAuth2 grant for that, the client credentials grant. One key piece of this is the service is server side. So you can actually keep secret values secret. If it was client side and was operating on behalf of really no one in particular, then you basically might as well not authenticate your API at all because those secrets are going to almost immediately leak. So in this case, since you always have your primary credentials um, coded somewhere, environment variables or a key store, there is no concept of a refresh token in this client credentials grant. Because of this, the flow is actually really simple. You call the authorization server and say, here are my client credentials, give me an access token, and the authorization server says, yep, those credentials are valid, and gives you an access token. The request payload looks like this. Instead of having a grant type of refresh or password, the grant type is client credentials. And you provide both a client ID and a client secret to the server to get your access token back. In this case, you won't actually have a subject on the access token uh, if it's uh, JWT, and that's actually fine. You can use scopes in your request here as well, but um, you'll actually get a different level of access here, at least hopefully, versus uh, operating on behalf of a user. So with that, let's do a couple of demos. First off, let's log into our really basic app here. So this application just has the concept of a little bit of user profile information, including this uh, hash value here, so we can exhibit kind of two pieces of information that we're asking for. Let's log back out. Then let's go over to a terminal to simulate a password grant on behalf of some server-side application that's maybe, maybe um, operating as just a proxy for a login form. So I will go, that is that here. Uh, and let's first take a look at, um, actually let, let's look at that in Storm. So as mentioned, we've got this um, pretty simple request. It's URL encoded. You have your grant type, client ID, username, password, and the scopes we're asking for. And we will actually um, look at um, various uh, scopes here uh, and, and kind of vary things depending on, uh, vary the server side response depending on which scopes we pass in. We'll start with no scopes at all. So we got an access token here. Here's the access token. Here's the refresh token, the expiration time, and the token type. We then turn around and use that to get user profile information. And uh, we can decode that JWT client side to uh, see various pieces of that token. <clears throat> 
as well as uh, what scopes that we defaulted to. We then refresh the token 10 seconds later, got a different access token, different refresh token because of implementation details on the legal off side. And you'll notice that the JWT payload here is a little bit different than the JWT payload here. So if we go to, if we request a different uh, scope here, then um, you'll notice that that scope was respected on a resource server. You have to ask for that sort of thing manually, but um, it actually is provided in a request attribute uh, as the token gets processed via the league OAuth resource server side of things, which the resource server is just whatever your API is that isn't solely responsible for authentication. Now you can have a resource server and authorization server um, on the same box or even within the same code base, but OAuth 2 is designed so that those can be separate. So that's the password grant and the refresh token grant. Let's look at client credentials. This happened a little bit more quickly because we don't have a concept of a refresh token here. We asked for a token and we got it. We also called a different endpoint this time because our API doesn't actually allow you to operate on behalf of a user when there's no user to operate on behalf of. This is a machine to machine client. We're still getting a uh, JWT back as the access token, but the subject field here is empty. Looking at the code behind this, we see a post here with client credentials and client ID and client secret, getting back the response, calling this time endpoint, and really that's it. We're taking a look inside the JWT as well, just as we did within the, um, within the password grant endpoint. So that, uh, those are our first few grant types there. Let's go back to our slides. There we go. So we've covered client side potentially and, um, and server to server interactions. However, what if you're dealing with some uh, JavaScript application that, um, that needs to authenticate, potentially with a third party. Well, the old way of doing things was the implicit grant. This was and is less secure than some of your other grant types, but the limitations that existed in earlier versions of web browsers meant you couldn't really do any better. You're still operating on behalf of a user, you're still saying that they can log in on the same device. But in this case, the, we, we don't want that single page app to see that user's username and password because it may be third party. And we can't have any guarantee that the entire application source won't be dumped and you can pick through it and uh, see what any secrets are in there. Now, the implicit grant does not have a refresh token because that kind of gives too much um, power uh, within a pretty uh, security constrained environment. Now, this is where you start getting into uh, having authorization consents and redirects and that sort of thing with the OAuth 2 flows. So this gets a little bit more involved. Specifically, I had to go with a little bit smaller um, font on this diagram because there's a little bit more going on. The end user is 
loading up the application in their web browser. They say log in with whatever provider that sends them over to the authorization server on a rendered web page on the auth server. The user authenticates with that, maybe does some two-factor auth or uh, additional verification. And then the authorization server hands back or redirects back to the single page app on some sort of callback page more than likely. It hands back an access token and a few other parameters in the URL fragment. The idea here is that if you have things in the query string parameters, then that might get picked up in logs because query string parameters are sent to the server, while fragment parameters are not. So you get a little bit of security back that way. Then um, if you, when you get redirected, you, you don't have that fragment on that URL that stays client side, but is still visible in say client side JavaScript to grab that information and authenticate to the resource server uh, as needed. So this is what that uh, initial URL looks like when you're redirecting over to the um, authorization server. Instead of token, we're hitting the authorize URL. Instead of a post, this is a get. We're providing the client ID. And that's all we're providing in terms of client authentication. We're providing a redirect URL or URI to say, hey, drop me back at this URL when the authorization process is complete. We tell the server that we want to be redirected back with a token rather than some other piece of authentication information. We potentially ask for scopes here, although that's not completely necessary. And we have this state parameter. Now, this state parameter is kind of a uh, anti-request forgery piece where you generate a state value within your client side application and you save that out. You redirect over to the authorization server. And when you get redirected back, you check that state, make sure things match so that you're not having some malicious application redirecting back to you with some other level of access that you didn't actually request. So once you authorize using this implicit flow, you get redirected back to your application. As mentioned before, we have all of the authentication information here in the fragment of the URL. Now this isn't foolproof. Uh, if you have some sort of browser state history saving, it may take that, um, or, or syncing, it may take that entire URL in the fragment uh, and push it somewhere that it really shouldn't be. But this is about the best we can do using uh, these particular constraints. But that's why I said that this was the old way of doing things, not the new way, which we'll get to later. So we get the state back from the server when it redirects. So we can compare that and make sure that somebody is not just randomly redirecting to us, potentially with a malicious payload. And we get this uh, same access token information in terms of token type, the token itself, and the expiration also in the fragment. These are all URL encoded within the fragment. Um, so you kind of have to parse that back out client side. Let's actually see what that looks like. need to read my own readme here to make sure I put in the correct thing. Slash spa dash implicit.php. For convenience's sake, I have this all running on the same host. Uh, that is not actually necessary. So go here, it's redirecting 
and you'll notice that in the URL here we have a um, the uh, client ID response type, et cetera, that we mentioned. We're, we just redirected to a login page here because we haven't logged in. So I'm going to do that. And we get this consent dialog here, which says that the application is asking for a couple of scopes. We hit approve. We get redirected back to that redirect URI that we set earlier, which the server side has to verify. We get an access token, token type bearer and state. Confirm that that state that we asked for initially matches the state that we got back. And then we make a uh, API call on behalf of that user. For the sake of time, I'll wait till the end to uh, look at these code samples, but um, y'all will see them at that point. So that's your implicit grant. Not a whole lot to it. So that dips our toe into the water of having rendered views on the authorization server that do a little bit more to provide authentication. That gets us into the authorization code grant. This is still operating on behalf of a user. However, this um, is maybe client side, maybe isn't. Might be able to keep track of secrets, may not be able to but this uh, has a higher level of uh, security than the other. And in so many cases, like if you have a login with Google that is say with Laravel Passport or some other provider like that, then you're going to be using the authorization code grant. And that is what a lot of your social sign-in providers give you. So what that looks like is a three-step process, request, redirect, and redeem. Now, the start of this process kind of looks like the implicit flow. You're redirected, you authenticate, authenticate with the authorization server, and you get a response back uh, on redirect. However, instead of an access token here, you get an authorization code. The client then turns around and asks the authorization server with its client ID and uh, potentially a client secret, and the redirect URI so that uh, it's an additional layer of uh, verification beyond, um, beyond the basics. The authorization server checks that against what the app is actually allowed to use in terms of uh, redirect URI and client ID and client secret and says, yes, everything matches and your authorization code is for a given user and it's still valid and it confers these scopes and issues an access token and uh, potentially a refresh token. So let's, uh, this is actually the method that is used to log me into slides.com. So when you click that login with Google button on slides.com, it ends up redirecting you to this. And calis.google.com. And um, instead of a response type of token like we saw in the implicit grant, it's a response type of code. And in the case of Google, if you ask uh, for an access type of offline, it'll give you a refresh token. If you don't, then it won't. Um, that is a Google specific convention there. Um, but we've got that same scope, client ID, redirect URI, and state that we did with the, um, with the implicit grant. So I authenticate, do two factor auth or whatever, and get redirected back to that callback URL. That looks like this. It's that same redirect URI that we asked for earlier, the same state that we provided, and this uh, authorization code, which is maybe an opaque token or maybe it has information encoded and encrypted in it. 
We also get a uh, scope uh, parameter back, which as I recall is specific to um, Google's implementation on this. It's not necessarily uh, baked into the OAuth spec. However, one important thing on this is you have this OpenID scope. Now, we'll get to what exactly that um, scope is later, but keep in mind that the OAuth 2 server can add or remove scopes relative to the ones you requested in authorization request. So server side, once we get that redirect and parse out the URL, we then turn around and ask for a token. In this case, the grant type is authorization code. We provide a client secret here. We provide the same redirect URI that we used earlier in the process, and we provide the authorization code. At that point, we get an access token response back. In Google's case, and this is part of the OpenID Connect spec, which is distinct from OAuth, you get an ID token back rather than uh, just a plain old access token. That ID token is uh, JSON encoded uh, and Base64 encoded. And um, that uh, JWT looks like this. We still have the same fields uh, as a standard uh, JWT, but with some additions. ISS stands for issuer, in this case, Google. Uh, AZP is uh, authorized party, and uh, that is, for example, a case where you have a web app uh, attempting to authenticate a user for access to a mobile app that maybe has a different client ID because they have uh, different security constraints around them. And this nonce is um, to prevent uh, all three play attacks. Additionally, uh, Google provides a few additional uh, fields in here. They are like email is actually one that is kind of consistently named in the OpenID Connect spec. The email verified flag is something that Google provides. Uh, likewise, you have a couple more Google specific fields in here where um, the AT hash is the uh, is a hash of the actual access token that was uh, provided along with this ID token. So you can kind of cross verify, although there are other ways of doing that uh, because you can validate the JWT signature on its own. And HD is uh, if somebody's logging in by G Suite, then that's going to populate here. If it's a standard uh, Gmail address, then it won't. So this um, OpenID Connect is actually discoverable uh, via this uh, do well-known document where at a given URL um, that is consistent across the implementation, you can pull up a lot of information about that implementation. You can say, okay, the, the issuer is whatever it is. Here's how you authorize. Here's how uh, you get tokens. Here's how you get user information. Um, you can get the um, the key, the public portion of the keys that Google uses to sign JWTs here, so you can actually verify them. And then it gives you a list of the response types supported, um, how the uh, actual uh, tokens are signed, which is uh, RSA with a uh, SHA-256 uh, hash um, and scopes and on down the line. Um, one thing to note here is that any provider that offers you the ability to uh, verify GWTs on your own is going to use an asymmetric key because if you have a symmetric key uh, based uh, JWT, for example, HMAC uh, rather than RSA, then if you have the key that you use to verify, you also have the key that you would need to sign. So you could forge your own uh, access tokens and uh, that's not what Google wants you to do or any other provider in that case. So 
with that, I said that um, the access tokens by implicit grant are kind of iffy and getting a secure client side implementation where um, you don't have the potential of a, a malicious app hijacking that redirect URI is kind of tough. And this shows an attack of uh, how you might have issues there. Um, the solution to that is while you can't keep secrets secret client side, at least you can verify that the same application that initiated the authorization request is the one that's receiving that, re that response back and turning around and asking for an access token with that auth code. Now, the way you do that is with proof key for code exchange or PKCE. You add to your uh, authorization request a hash of a value that you keep locally. Kind of like the state parameter that I mentioned earlier, except again, you're, you're hashing it. Yes, the spec technically says that you can provide a plain value and not hash it, but don't do that. Uh, you provide the hash value to the authorization server. You get the authorization code back. And then you turn around and say, all right, here's the authorization code. And oh, by the way, here's the non-hashed version of that verifier that I gave you before, proving that you are indeed the same client that an initially requested that access. The server verifies that, yes, indeed, if I hash this uh, verifier value, then I get the hash that I was provided earlier, and it gives you the access token. This authorization request process looks a whole lot like the uh, standard OAuth2 authorization code grant, except we have this new, um, we have the response type of code here, just like with the auth code grant, but we have a code challenge method in code challenge provided along with it. The code challenge method here just stands for SHA-256. Then when we turn around and redeem that authorization code for an actual token, we provide grant type of auth code, provide the code, and then we provide the code verifier. If the server doesn't see that code verifier or the code verifier doesn't actually match with uh, what was provided earlier, then the authorization process fails. So uh, this is going to be the um, final demo here. I'm going to skip the remaining slides because we're basically at time, but let's actually see what the auth code grant um, looks like both server side and client side. So we immediately redirected it because I'd already been logged in. We have our client ID up there, we have the response type, we have the scopes, and we have a uh, state. I approve this client. And this uh, here is all actually uh, happening server side. We get the code back in the query string. We get the same state back, confirm that that matches. Um, we get the code, get the state, turn around, get the access token, and confirm that the user actually uh, gets what they need there. Now, for client side, Going to redirect over the authorization page. And we had already um, gotten authorization for that particular application. So it skipped that consent page, gave us back this 
code and state in the URL. And then we had to turn around and redeem that code for uh, an access token. And in this case, we get a refresh token back, even though this all happened client side. You can look at the code um, within uh, the repo to see how I did this. It is plain old JavaScript uh, using a couple of web crypto APIs to uh, generate the uh, random data and to run a SHA-256 hash on it, but um, nothing terribly exotic and none of this required uh, so much as jQuery to work. So with that, that is the lightning tour through the uh, grant types that you could potentially see out in the world, including um, the uh, new PKCE grant and how to actually make that work. And um, because of time, we didn't really look at the server side code there, but I can stick around after and walk through that as well, uh, provided that Marcus doesn't uh, immediately kick me off of uh, the screen share. And um, likewise, all of the client side code here uh, is available in that same project on GitHub, plain old JavaScript. I do use uh, fetch and async await to make my life less miserable, but the same, um, the same uh, sort of idea applies if you use promises or some of the older methods. So with that, um, I will open this up for questions. Um, if you want to look at more information on JWTs, jbt.io by Autho is pretty solid. OAuth.net gives you a easier way of reading through uh, documentation on OAuth versus the um, RFCs, which aren't horrible, but they're kind of lengthy. Uh, PHP League OAuth 2 package is what I use to make the server-side interactions uh, possible, and that includes PKCE. And if you're a Laravel dev, then um, the Laravel uh, Passport library wraps around OAuth 2, uh, the league library, and provides you with OAuth 2 um, capabilities there in a rather opinionated way. So I'm going to have you look at questions now. Um, Thanks very much, Ian. Um, just to let everyone know, if they uh, want to put questions as a Q&A tab, uh, just open that up. It's on the bottom of your screen, and you can uh, put, put, put those questions in. Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much for that, Ian. I think there's already one question for you from Dan. Yes, and um, uh, Dan, to answer that question, so the, the question is, do you... Are there certain cases where you don't want to use OAuth 2 um, when, uh, for your authentication method? Uh, I would say if you are just doing a standard login form where uh, everything is first party, everything is back and forth server side, particularly if you're trying to have additional uh, levels of authentication in there with uh, two-factor or something like that, which you should do, um, then OAuth 2 doesn't really help you there. Uh, it's additional overhead and um, just in general, getting things set up even with uh, something like Lee OAuth is non-trivial. So if you just have a plain old login form with your own site, then the benefit is limited and, and the overhead is there. Um, additionally, if you are, um, if you want, if you're willing to keep track of your end user um, kind of session state and expiration and that sort of thing server side, then um, you don't really need JWTs either. You can use an opaque token. However, League OAuth to make things easier on implementers uses JWTs everywhere. Um, you can kind of mix and match that, but if you end up having to, wanting to um, 
use a uh, an opaque token with OAuth2, you kind of have to roll your own. You can't just use League OAuth2's uh, off-the-shelf stuff. So if you have a um, if you have a login process that's that's quite simple and you don't need kind of third-party apps um, integrating with that, then OAuth2 may not be the right choice. Likewise, if you're dealing with uh, API interactions, um, it's going to be easier on your implementers if you have a straight flat API key. And um, I say this because there's, for a brand new project that I'm working on, we're discussing back and forth how we're gonna authenticate with it. And for to start that, we're going to use a bearer token uh, that's just an API key as an opaque key rather than having some sort of JWT or OAuth uh, integration. So pr practicing what I preach there, there, there is a certain point at which your use case gets complex enough that you might as well use a standardized way of uh, interacting. But before you get to that point, um, then there's not a whole lot of sense in pulling things in that you don't necessarily need. Um, so, uh, another question from the same questioner. It seems that OAuth2 providers have small implementation details everywhere in their APIs. Do you recommend using specific libraries for connecting to OAuth servers, or is a generic library good enough? Um, it, for the client side, it depends on the provider, how generic their implementation is. For example, Google's uh, setup, um, it's, it should work fine in a more generic use case. However, um, particularly on that initial URL that you decide to redirect over to, there are a couple of extra parameters in there that you probably want to, for example, maintain uh, session state beyond uh, that initial access token. So if somebody has an SDK for, um, for their OAuth implementation, then there's a decent chance that um, to not run into issues where it's like, well, I, I needed a refresh token and I didn't get it. The SDK is usually has got those pieces baked in where you can, for example, request a refresh token or correctly spell a really long scope or anything like that. So if somebody has an SDK for their OAuth2 implementation, then uh, either use that one or like Laravel has the socialite providers for um, various OAuth servers that bake some of that functionality in that way as well. Um, if somebody doesn't provide an SDK in a bunch of languages for their OAuth2 implementation, either um, they, they, they may or may not have something that's fully out of the box standard, but my, my feel on that is if they don't provide an SDK, then chances are they're, they're a lot closer to a standard implementation and you can use a more generic client. 